it's weird how the regen approach is kind of to do the right thing at the start and then kind of do nothing versus the industrial approach is to continually juice the the, the death uh, forever, basically, because again, it gets back to the point of that soil basically becomes a growing media. It's not a living ecosystem when you're doing it the the old way. Well, dead mineral medium and teeming with life yeah. kind of says it all. Most of the time here in the Epic Gardening Podcast, we were, of course, talking about gardening. But if there's one thing I've learned about the garden, it is that it plays in to the greater ecosystem. So today, I'm really excited. We have Will Harris on the show. He is a fourth generation cattleman who really tends to the same land that his great grandfather settled in 1866, transitioning it from a more industrial cattle ranch to a regenerative agriculture ranch. So I'm, I'm really excited to have you on the show, Will. This is something that I personally don't know much about, only through perhaps watching or, or listening to someone like yourself talk about it. I don't have any direct experience, so I'm really excited to chat with you. Well, thank you for having me, Kevin. Well, I appreciate the yeah. opportunity to be on your show. Yeah, yeah. So if we take it back to, you know, it's fourth generation, so you guys, your family's been doing this for quite some time, but are you the one who has transitioned it from, I guess, sort of a more monocultural cattle system to this regen system? I, I am. And in fact, in fact, I operated it as an industrial cattle operation for the first 20 years of my career. Okay. So the, the uh, coming full circle is happening on my watch and my daughter's watch. What was the moment, or perhaps it was many moments, that made you decide to make that change? Because I can imagine... I don't know much about cattle ranching, but I could imagine it'd be a very, very difficult switch from that type of system to this new one. Yeah, it was a difficult switch, but uh, there was a moment. You know, I was, uh, I think probably the reason I made the decision to, to make the move is because I was so industrial. It, you know, I, 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 I kind of overdid the the, uh, the technology part of the, of the equation when I made the decision to quit doing it, I, I kind of cold turkey quit doing it. Yeah. We, were, we were loading a load of heifers uh, to ship to Nebraska one morning, and it just seemed so wrong to me. And the transition was immediate, but it's taken 25 years to get where we are. What was it about that moment of loading the heifers up that it just, just sort of hit you in a moment of clarity or something like that, where you're like, this has just got to change? Yeah, it did. It did. And I, I can't tell you exactly what, what, what was different about that morning. There, there wasn't much I could, I, I could put my finger on that was different, but it just it suddenly seemed this, 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 tra this transactional uh, part of what I did for a living and it done many, many, many times it just didn't seem right anymore. Yeah, you know, to take uh, you can put a uh, hundred, five hundred pound heifers on a, on a two day truck, double day truck, yeah. and to put them on there, the ones on the top urinating and defecating on the ones on the bottom for thirty hours without wow. food or water or rest, something I've done dozens of times in my life. But that day, I said, you know, this is. This is not a good deal. Yeah. Yeah. I, it's, it's so, it's fascinating to me because I, I don't know, and maybe this is where we begin this episode is I don't actually really know what the industrial system structure even looked like. Like the, the process you're describing, I don't know where those cattle, those heifers are going and why they're even going there. So maybe we could take a look back at like just the basic overview of how an industrial cattle, cattle ranch operates. Yeah, well. The, the simple explanation is everything is done for efficiency. Everything that's done is done to take cost out of per pound production of the product, which is the live cattle. Yeah. And, and that's mostly a function of utilizing technologies, whether the technologies be chemical fertilizer, pesticides, hormonal plants, subtherapeutic antibiotics, dot, dot, dot. 
Yeah. And you know, those technologies exist because re, uh, reductive science gave them to us and proved that they take cost out of production. And we, we, our temptation is there to overuse or abuse those tools. And, but even if you do, there, there are unintended consequences that come from all of them. They accomplish what they are purported to accomplish, no doubt about it. But it, it, it does come with unintended consequences, and the unintended consequences have great costs. Yeah. Are we talking, Will, more about, again, like I, I can only make an analogy to the garden. We talk a lot about basically a re regenerative approach to the garden where you're recycling nutrients from the garden back to it. You're composting your scraps. You're maybe cycling nutrients through a chicken system, bringing that manure out to the garden versus the, call it a uh, scaled down industrial monoculture garden, which would be pumping your soil full of synthetic fertilizers, over fertilizing 24 seven. And basically the soil becomes effectively just a growing medium for synthetics uh, to be in. It, it's, it sort of seems like something similar is going on in the industrial ca cattle process where you're the, the cow's the product mm -hmm. and you're sort of juicing it up and yeah your per pound price goes down but the second order sort of consequences down right. the stream are the catastrophic ones you don't really see those until much later yeah i think it's i think it's idyllically the same situation yeah uh, it's you know one is very cyclical one is very linear uh, yeah it, it, it's uh yeah how do you be I was going to say, how how does it, if we go now to the transition, you said you're 25 years into this now, where would you say you're at as far as your, your the, sort of the pinnacle of regenerative ag where, where one might want to be versus where you are today? Well, no, we're still learning. Make yeah. no mistake. We're still figuring it out. Yeah. And, you know, we talk a lot about the cycles of nature. And the cycles of nature for me are the, the, the mineral cycle, the energy cycle, the water cycle, the uh, uh, microbial cycle, you know, probably two or three or four of those that I can recognize. Yeah. And I think there are many more than that. And, yeah. And, and what we do here is all about optimizing those cycles of nature so that we generate an abundance and we make our living on the abundance. Yeah. And it's again, it's very cyclical versus being very linear. The other product, the other production model, the industrial production model, is very, very linear. Yeah. And you said it. You said it exactly right. There are you know, the the costs aren't saved. They're they're set downstream to someone else to deal with. Yeah. In some cases. Yeah. Well, it, what, what you do, what you do in your garden, what I do in my pastures, is remarkably simple. It is. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's interesting because I, I don't have the historical sort of familial history of, of managing a garden. I kind of got into it in my early twenties, but if you compress that timeline down, maybe my 10 years of growing experience, I would say the first few for sure were the more industrial or commercial garden recommended approach. Cause that's just what was out there. Um, and it feels like a lot of this stems from it's almost like an industrial revolution thing when we realized we could put things into production systems and get reliable output on the other side. Now, of course, at the beginning of that, that was mostly like mechanical products or cars or tools or something like that. But we started to apply that same linear thinking to basically every process in life and the process of life, like cattle or, or gardening or, or what have you, farming does seem to play better when you take the reins off a little bit, understand how all the systems interconnect and let the systems kind of output to you what they what they would naturally. Uh, obviously enhanced a bit because you're yeah. controlling it to some degree. Yeah, there, there are a lot of reasons why we, you know, I would say the post-World War II, we started moving the cyclical living cycle of, of the food production more into the linear uh, model. It, it, it was easier to teach in college. It's less situational. Uh, it, and, 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 then, and then what happened is people started making a lot of money on it. I mean, it became very, very profitable. So we moved 
further and faster in that direction, then we continue to move in that direction. And and I think this uh, you know, is probably going to be an end to it at some point. I don't know exactly how that will look. Yeah, I, I think about that a lot because I, I see and talk to a lot of backyard market farmers. So they're, they're servicing, maybe it's just the property they actually live on. Maybe they secure it a quarter acre, an acre, and they're growing on that and just distributing that produce locally. And I, I think like, are there going to be hundreds, thousands more of these folks? How is this sort of regenerative movement going to actually look in the 40, 50 year future? I, I have no idea, but I, I do kind of want to talk about, cause I don't know the specifics of how, how you do a regenerative cattle ranch. I know how it might look in a garden, but what's like the basic overview of that process? I guess the first step is to give up those technologies that are tools to enhance production. I already mentioned them, but, uh, you know, the, the olive forms, hormone implants, chemical fertilizers, uh, uh, hybrid, hybrid, uh, grasses, forages, and and when you do that, to give up, when you give up those tools, you add to your cost of production. All those uh, tools have cost, but they yield a net return to the farmer. And so it it, it for when we made that ch- those changes, it forced us to find a different way to market the beast. Uh, when I first started changing, I gave up those tools, but continued to dump my beef into the commodity system yeah. and, and I would have gone broke had I persisted in doing it. Yeah. So you had to tell it, a different story about the product at that point in time. It forced me to find a, a, a different market that would pay the increase per pound cost yeah. that I had brought back into my operation. I no longer set those costs downstream. Yeah. I absorbed them into my beef production. So I had to re- recoup that when I sold it. What, if who, we, if we, what market ended up accepting that that sort of newly positioned product? We 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 uh, we formed our own beef company called White Oak Pastures. Yeah, and it, uh, yeah. And we, we, we the name of the farm. Yeah, nothing nothing particular original or penning there, but uh, we started marketing our beef. Yeah, our timing is really really. We're very early in the grass-fed beef model. Yeah. And I don't know if we could have done today what we did then. We, we no longer sell for beef to Whole Foods Market, but Whole Foods Market was a very custom of And yeah. uh, Publix, Kroger, we, we, I ran it as a wholesale business. I live in a town with 105 people, so the, it is very economically impoverished. So this, this was not the market for my higher price for, for higher quality beef. So getting it yep. to the consumer that would pay the price difference was an issue. But our timing was very fortunate. And we filed those big grocery companies. And we, we, we have had to rethink that since. That's sure. Traffic. I do have a question about, you know, it, it feels like the industrial model is, I wouldn't say infinitely scalable, but it's a linear model that you can scale quite quite high is there a natural cap to the scalability of a regenerative approach like in acres or production there there is and that's a great question and i i would not be so presumptuous as you knew a number of acres but i could tell you the white of bastions is a total of about five thousand acres and we're as big as we need to be yeah and I, i i would not choose to be this big but I built a processing plant to process a USD, USDA inspected processing plant to process the beef. It's on that, and I, I need that much volume to make that work. I see. You know, in yeah. a perfect world where you have a co-op of a dozen producers, you would not have to have five thousand. Right. So you could have and a I smaller can't... portion of the five thousand. You could process for the rest of the producers. And it would be a, that would be a lovely way of doing it. When I built my processing plant, there was one of only two own farm USDA processing plants in the nation in the United States of America. Wow! So, but I had to do it because I didn't have any other option. You know, yeah. Today, other options exist. But to give you the question, 
I don't want to be any bigger than we are right now. I yeah. need that schedule here to uh, financially operate my processes with. But I see you know, what we do here. I, I say is highly replicatable. Yeah, but not highly scalable. Sure, that makes sense. That's that's sort of what I've seen as the analog to the the market farm approach is you can do a lot of these market farmers much smaller scale in total revenue dollars compared to let's say a, a cattle ranch, but they can do a you know a six figure take home income servicing you know maybe a twenty mile radius from a two to three acre plot in the backyard maybe half acre to an acre growing like very high value vegetables that chefs prize or the home market prizes, but you you do need you know, 4,200 more of them dotted around just the state of California, probably to make that distribution model work for the the produce. So it's, it's fascinating to think about how that's actually going to work. What, what is the average acreage of a conventional industrial ranch? <clears throat> that is highly variable. Yeah. You know, uh, uh, in the, uh, uh, West, the great West, so where there's so much less rainfall you know, 20, 30, 40,000 acre ranches are not uncommon, but they probably don't raise as much beef as I raise with my 5,000 acres here. It's highly variable. You mentioned you have 5,000 acres right now in a town of 105. I'm curious how that has impacted the town. You know, the three things that we brag about, the only three things that we boast on our website is our uh, regeneration of degraded land the welfare to our animals, and the re-enrichment of our little community. Yeah. And the, the first two were very, very intentional. I didn't like the way we were treating the land and the animals, so I thought about it a lot and put a lot of effort into making changes to do it different. I, I never, ever considered economically benefiting the, the town. Yeah, we would be yeah. uh, this town, like most, like most rural agrarian towns, have been in decline since World War II, the end of World War II. That's when that started. The impoverishment of rural America began. And I was born in 1954. Yeah, when I was born, I don't think we realized, I don't think my parents realized, parents realized the city was in economic decline in yeah. the county. But it was. In retrospect, looking back, it was. Yeah. So I grew up here, and it, it, it literally, our population peaked in 1900. Oh, wow. 1900. Wow, 50 and years after, before you were born. The, the yeah, the uh, uh, statistics, uh, population shows population decline every census wow. for 10 years. Yeah, until now, we've grown a little bit now. And, you know, by the time I got through college, came back, the town was certainly dying, almost dead. And it was just the way it was. It wasn't just this time. All of the agrarian towns around here was the same, same story. Yeah. So when I decided to change the way I run this farm and focus on, on the grass, this grass that program was part of, uh, the, the animals of the land were, were the focus. We had no effort on my part at all towards the community. But over the last 25 years, I have gone from three or four minimum wage employees to about 180 employees. They well above the county average. We're the largest wow. employer in the county, private employer in the county by, by far. Yeah. And, and it economically revived the title. We people want to live here. People want to live here. And I'm just, that's become one of the things I'm most proud of. Again, yeah. the way of the outdoors in the community. Yeah. Yeah, it makes sense. Because, I mean, obviously, when you're moving towards this new model, the land and the animals, there's a very conscious choice to improve those two things. The second sort of effect would be that the town, if, if the job's done well, right, that the town would come back to some degree. It sounds like it. It totally has. What was? What do you think is the reason that the these small agrarian towns you're mentioning that maybe their population peaked over a hundred years ago? What's the cause of that decline? If it peaked in 1900, I could imagine perhaps like 
in the 60s, it might have made sense, at least to my brain, because because industrial ag was scaling up, maybe the resources are being sucked out to these bigger companies or something. But w- what do you think is causing that that decline? You know, I can't go back to 1900, but uh, I, 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 do, I can't go back a long way. And I'm pretty sure that, and again, my, great, my great-grandfather bought this farm in 1866. So yep. the family law is here. But I think that uh, as technology developed, internal combustion engines and other things, uh, less and less people were needed on the farm. Less and less people could make a living on the farm. The farm has got bigger and bigger, causing less and less people to be here. Margins got tighter and tighter, so we could afford less and less people to be here. Here, by the time I... Uh, went to college, you know, the brain dream was well underway. You know, the people that came home to the farm were the C and D students. Yeah. You know, yeah. And uh, so I, I, I've, the, the change that occurred is uh, when we changed the way we farm, it started, it, it brought an appeal to very different people. So many of the people that work on this farm are not Southern farm kids. Well, we, I frequently will be sitting at that. We, we eat together every day at, at lunch. I'll be sitting at a, t- at a table with a dozen people. And I'll say, yeah, I'm the only one here from Georgia. Yeah. And I'm the only one here that was raised on a farm. And I'm the only one here that had a career outside agriculture. Yeah. Well, it's just, it's just incredible to me. And these people that we have brought here are such incredible people. They're here because they want to be here. They're not here because I pay them more. Right. They're making it in uh, Atlanta or Jacksonville or yeah. Memphis. There's an inherent reason that's driving them to, to come out and, and do that type of work. It's I think it's it's got to be encouraging because you hear about the average age of the farmer keeps going up which sort of implies that no one's taking those jobs over and it's cool to hear that that's not the case at least at, at your place you have some new new folks coming in especially someone who's never grown up on a farm I mean I guess look at myself I didn't grow up gardening grew up in a suburban southern California sort of way which was call it like the the traditional path I guess so to speak and, and here I am try, trying my best to kind of learn alternative ways of, of, of doing things. How, how did these folks who are on the farm now come to find out about the job in the first place if they weren't from Georgia, didn't grow up on a farm, et cetera? You know, we, we, are, we were really early on, early in the regenerative farm business. You know, I yeah. started moving this, this business that way in the mid-'80s, and nobody was doing it much back then. So as a result, we got a, a probably a little bigger web presence than most people. So I think that's probably how it happens. We don't, uh, other than on our website, we don't advertise or solicit people. Yeah. Uh, we only we have we have a very a really good internship program. That I'm very proud of. We take six interns per quarter, four times a year. Yeah. And we, out of the number, we probably get 25 applications for every quarter. So we can really be, select who we bring in. And if you ever worked on a farm, it's not part of the criteria. You know, I, I like these young people. Yeah. When I say young people, I don't read kids. We we have had, uh, we have seldom, but occasionally had an interns and we're fresh out of high school. But for the most part, everybody's a college graduate or a uh, military person who's discharged. Yeah. We uh, we, should, we, I, we had an intern once. When I was 65 years old, I had a 65-year-old intern here who did great. That's cool. That's a, that's that's oh, unusual, yeah. but having interns who are here in their 30s or 40s is not unusual. Yeah. I mean, I think it's a cool fact that the question have you worked on a farm doesn't show up because otherwise where's that applicant pool going to be coming from right that that's the pool that's that's the one that's shrinking so you got to open it up to folks who are trying trying something new 
you know, are there other farms in the area? Are they running more of a regenerative approach as a result of kind of seeing what you're doing? Or is there still a bunch of conventional ag farms out there where you're, where you're yeah. at? That's, that's a great disappointment to me. Uh, agriculture is the only industry we have here. So, and then we're in a, an area in which the topography and most of the land can be worked. <laughs> so, uh, uh, the, I have many farming neighbors, but I have had uh, very little, if any, impact here changing things. Yeah. No, and and that, that's a disappointment to me. I really thought that might be different. Well, I understand it. You know, economically, this is not particularly rewarding. It's not. <laughs> I can't. I can't. I can't go to my neighbors who farm corn industrially for farm corn, cotton, and peanuts, and say, "Hey, man, you can make a lot more money if you'll go this way." I can't tell them that. Right. Right. Uh, so. Uh, and, you know, there's, there's very little economic incentive to do this way. And I think in the short run, I think in the long yeah. run, I'm improving my land, which is my investment. And, mm -hmm. But it's a, it's a, it's still a very industrial yeah. area. It's interesting because I, I thought <laughs> on a much smaller scale, I thought that growing out in my front yard, orchard in the front yard, raised beds, growing beautiful crops, uh, very clearly harvesting and using that food in my, my little neighborhood here would impact the neighbors as well to some degree really hasn't as well i mean obviously with the content we produce people around the country or the world are doing it but that those are the ones that are self-selecting much like probably the folks who are self-selecting to come and work at your place and so it feels like uh getting on the web and social has had more impact weirdly than just showing your neighbors what's what's going on and i think part of it too is like there just has to be that intrinsic desire to want to do something different you mentioned that um, the per, the price per pound output of the beef, especially in the early days of going regenerative, goes higher. So you had to find a different market to serve it to, so you could recoup that cost. Tell a better story about the product. Have you found that decades later, the price per pound has declined because of the efficiency gain of improving the landscape and working all these systems better? Well, and the land is more productive. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, is it? Uh, is it as uh, cost effective to produce uh, grass fed beef was it as industrial beef? No, it's still not. Yeah. And, it, and, and to be honest, my my uh, accounting system is not good enough for me to tell you exactly yeah. you know, how that What works. you end up at, yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. I've, 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 I've come in on this. So we've got, we've probably got $30 million in assets here. Yeah. And probably ten million in debt, so there's a lot of equity here. Yeah, but the business is a very break evenish business. Yeah, yeah. So it's a, it's it's you know I've had, I've had to I, I used to really encourage people to come this way, and I I I still encourage people to come this way, but I have to, I have to tell them the truth about the economic impact. Yeah, you know, that's just hard. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, you got to you got to hope there's a way that somehow the market, the demand, whatever equation makes that, whatever part of the equation makes that math work a little more favorably. It's funny you mentioned the debt and equity of the business. I, I met a guy, he's a really big tree producer here in, in the States. A lot of fruit trees, but also a lot of like privacy hedges and shrubs and stuff. Self Self-made never never raised anything has has only sort of built the business off of debt or like the farm sort of credit system and and he's in a similar position where he, on, on paper the equity in that business is absolutely massive um but he's sort of at the whim of his bankers sometimes because cool. it's 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 sometimes it's a tight business so it's i think it's important to kind of share that as well and hoping that it <laughs> hopefully it'd be nice if you could just tell your neighbors hey it's actually you'll you'll make more money if you do it this way sometime in the future well and i it used to be that way yeah you know we uh when uh when, when we were first when grass fed beef was first becoming a new thing in the late 90s or 2000s uh we could we could get enough of a premium on it that we got a very nice return on investment. Yeah. And I, I was very pleased with it. And I would encourage, overtly encourage people to come this way. 
uh, principally the importation of grass-fed beef from other countries has really yeah. caused a decline in margins. So that has made it harder for me to encourage people to do this. I, th- I think, I mean, I don't, I don't want to change what I do. I mean, yeah. I mean as long as I can pay my debts, meet my obligations, live comfortably, and improve the value of my land every year, I'm happy with it. I yeah. think I'm making money, but it's equity, not cash. Right, right. Yeah. I mean, it's such an interesting, it's such a different way to think about <laughs> uh, business compared to how a lot of folks will, right? Where they want it to cash flow. They want to try to pull that money out of the business, upgrade their lifestyle, et cetera. Whereas this this approach is more like, no, this is the lifestyle. The business is the asset that's growing. You know, as a gardener, soil health is is the thing, right? It's the thing we always say, if you're going to spend the time and effort to improve one thing, on your land, it's soil health, so that everything gets easier from there on. And for you, how how much does that matter? Basic question, I guess, maybe a simple question. How much does that matter for a, a cattle rancher? Soil health, just as much as it does to you. Yeah, absolutely, just as much as it does to you. You know, the I told you previously that uh, the the animal welfare to level was the first thing that that started me rethinking being an industrial cattle producer. But it was just a a very short time that the soil health became just as important to me. And I can remember uh, going to a place on my farm where I had been actively farming it. My my father had farmed it, my grandfather, my great-grandfather, and and for for, for all, all of our lives. It's been farmed for a hundred plus years, and it's what we consider to be good soil. But it, you can get a handful of it. It's just a dead mineral medium. Yeah. Then just just a few feet over there at the edge of the forest, I could reach down and get a handful, and it was just teeming with life. And this one was moist, and this one was dry. And things were crawling out of this one, you know, up my sleeve, and nothing was over here. I mean, it's just, it was like it was from two different planets. Yeah. But it was just a few feet apart. And the difference was that the the dirt, this dirt and soil, and the dirt had been plowed and fertilized and, and had uh, pesticides put on it for a long, long time. And the other hadn't. That was the only difference. Yeah. So I knew exactly what I needed to do. It was interesting for me when I moved into this house that I'm on now. It's only 13,000 square feet. And it was a home that, old home, 1920s home that uh, some flippers had bought from the original family owners. They did some very light touch-ups to the house. And then the outside, I think they just took a sod scraper, scraped the 12-ish thousand square feet clean of weeds and then threw some wood chips on that was their little dress up and so you know from a garden's perspective you go okay this is basically construction topsoil that's been either fallow or just weedy for how who knows how long maybe little patches of grass here and there and it was the same exact situation except for i couldn't even get my hand in because it was pure you know light brown clay no texture to it no no difference in particle size or life or anything like that and what we did early on is we put about a foot's worth of of chips on anything we weren't actively cultivating just let it be let let the rain come down etc and now we can get in there about i don't know six to eight inches or so the earthworms are crawling their way through there's some smaller life uh and yeah it takes it takes some time but it's it's weird how the regen approach is kind of to do the right thing at the start and then kind of do nothing Versus the industrial approach is to continually juice the the, the death uh, forever, basically, because, again, it gets back to the point of that soil basically becomes a growing media. It's not a living ecosystem when you're doing it the, the old way. Well, dead mineral medium and teeming with life yeah. kind of says it all. There you go. And, 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 and you did what you did there, and it worked for you, and it's great. Congratulations. But if you could get animal impact, yeah. You know, yeah. I, I I can assure you you would love it. You know that 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 sort of, that sort of just the benefit of uh, that animal that ruminant 
dropping the feces that contains great mic mic microfauna, microfauna. Uh, you look at the, the insects, you know, dull beetles, earthworms. You see, it's a beautiful thing. Yeah, yeah. It's it's another. It's just another layer to that whole system, right? Where you know, take take my garden, garden. All I've really got there is I've got the earthworms. I've got some sort of microbes in the soil. But then, if you go over to my chicken run, I've got the chickens in there too now, and so I'm planting around that area. But they're scratching, so they're sort of lightly tilling that soil, mm. not nothing crazy. But then they're eating scraps from the garden and inter- passing it through their system, which, to your point, brings in some of the microbes that perhaps the soil would not natively have that maybe it needs. And then they're fertilizing with, with the droppings. And so I've I've thought, and I haven't done it yet, of doing a soil test, taking a little core of the chicken coop area versus a pathway in the garden versus maybe a garden bed and seeing if there's a nutrient difference there. Cause I'm, I guarantee the chicken one is probably extremely high. Well, I can tell you, I'll show you. Yeah. So Will, when you switched over to the regenerative model, how long did it take for that soil to improve to the point where you feel like it's like pretty good now? Well, it's much, if we are on, on a larger track, we will we, we operate it it's it's pretty slow I mean, yeah i would say the first really probably five the first year or two production just falls through the floor because yeah. we go from you know using chemical fertilizer we pretty much wiped out the, the beneficial microbes in the soil yeah and uh had been animals on it to you know, feces going back in hoof activity speeds it up but I would say that it take it takes up to five years for it to, to really recover. So I, yeah. I think this is becoming a healthy sort. Yeah. And is it are are they just grazing on this is my sort of lack of a farming knowledge here. Are they just grazing on whatever was growing there natively or are you actively cultivating some sort of crop for them to eat? That's a good that's a good question. So there I used to have my pastures all established in the uh, Tifton 85 Bermuda grass, which okay. is a hybrid yeah. Bermuda grass that requires copious quantities of chemical nitrogen to live, but it'll grow like crazy. And when I quit using chemical nitrogen, I lost my stand of Tifton 85 Bermuda grass. Other things out competed. You see? And the other things that out competed it. Uh, Early old are pretty uh, uh, pest. Really, a lot of a lot of stuff you really don't want. Yeah. But uh, as the land becomes healthier, uh, it'll it'll uh, the, the the mix changes, and it changes yeah. from year to year. Eric. Certain certain years, different species will have greater dominance. Yeah. But I I well, love. Yeah, you know, I used to think that pretty. Was a monoculture, yeah. You know, right, just row after row after row of the same species growing, and now I love that mixture of all so many different species, plants, but also animals and also microbes living in symbiotic relationships with each other. It's just, it's just a, it's a beautiful thing, and it's increasingly productive. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's funny because as a kid, I used to go, we used to drive through Northern California with with all the nut trees up there, um, and it's you, you get that when you're driving through and they're perfectly laid out. You can see straight down the row, and you can see at a 45 degree angle, and so you have those three kind of clear lines, and, and you're zipping by. And I remember as a kid thinking that was so pleasing to look at, maybe just the inherent structure and organization of it. And then as an adult, especially knowing what I know now about how that system actually works, I go, okay, that <laughs> it might look kind of cool, but it, it's not actually doing that much for, for the soil there. Um, and so it's, it's interesting you say that the same thing, I guess, about the forage. Is, are any of the, the species that are, you know, d- becoming more dominant in a particular year or not, are, are any of those stuff that you're sowing on purpose or is that just all naturally what's showing yeah. up on the landscape? We have a, a real, I'm, I'm about 80 miles from the Gulf of Mexico. Yeah, it's a semi-tropical environment. 
And we do, we can grow, grow uh, summer perennials really, really well. They just do great here. We get 52 inches of rain a year, a lot of radiation. Summer uh, perennials just do warm. Season perennials just do great. We do not do coon season perennials very well at all. There's one called fescue that we're just too hot for it to do good. So we take advantage of that and oversee the, the, all of our pastures every year with a no-till grain drill and a mixture of cool seeds and annuals. Yeah, it, 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 it's wonderful. I, I can graze living plants about, so I, I don't know what I'm saying, but you know, we have uh, the dominant species are of grass, grasses and forbs are warm season perennials, and we oversee every acre every year with cool season annuals, a cocktail mix of a, a clover, a brassica, a cereal like rye, wheat, oats, and rye grass. Yeah, so we uh, we get about ten months gra uh, grazing season out of that, which is. Just great. I mean, that's that, that, not, 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 not many parts of the economy of the U.S. get that. Yeah, what's a normal season for grazing? I, I'd imagine more like six months. One of my best friends, a guy named Gabe Brown in North Dakota, and I bet he, I bet six months is a long growing season for him. But uh, there's an offset. The quality of forage that he produces is way better than ours. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. It probably is. He, he probably produces as much nutrition per acre as we do, but ours comes over a longer window, which okay. in, in my in my mind is is better. Yeah, it may not be better, but just because I'm not how to manage it, but you know, I, I don't have to store forage for six months. I don't have to store forage for a couple of months. Yeah. Interesting. I didn't think about the fact that longer or shorter isn't absolutely better or worse. It it has to do with the nutrition per acre as well. That's pretty fascinating. Yeah, I bet I bet I bet his nutrition per acre is as good as mine. It may be better than mine, but mine comes uh, over more the yeah. Yeah, makes sense. Well, it's a fascinating look into the soil health because we obviously on this podcast we talk about it all the time, guys. But hearing about it at the scale of five thousand acres of regenerative cattle farming is super fascinating and we really haven't gotten to the actual animals themselves in your old model i guess like what's the animal's life actually like well you know when i was an industrial cattle producer before i decided to change so many things uh, i believe that my animal welfare was above reproach I, I thought it was great you know i had been raised to believe you know by, by my father and was a a fairly legendary cowman, and by my form, formal education at the University of Georgia College of Agriculture, that good animal welfare meant you kept the animal well fed, well watered, in a comfortable temperature range, and you didn't intentionally inflict pain or suffering. And if you did that, you know that's good animal welfare. It's a bug approach. You're fine. Good to go. Check that box. And it wasn't until I started on this, this journey that I really decided that, that yeah, all those are important. But equally important is to give the animal the opportunity to express its instinctive behavior. Cow cows are meant to roll and graze. Hogs are meant to ro root and wallow. Chickens are meant to scratch and peck. But in the industrial model, they don't get to do this. None of them get to to express those instinctive behaviors. And if they can't, it's not going to be a good life. It's not you way. It's not you way. You know, if you have if you've got a, a, a kid, and you say, you know, I really love my child, and I'm going to put him or her in a closet with a, a mattress. I'm going to leave a light on. I'm going to keep it 72 degrees in the air. I'm going to give all the 
chocolate chip cookies and brownies and lemonade they want. And that that's good child welfare because they won't get run over, they won't get abducted, they won't get, you know, whatever. But it's not. Right. Well, you know, they be out the child of a good child that means to express instinctive behavior. And the same is true with Alan. Yeah, it's it's interesting. It almost kind of reminds me of like a Western Eastern approach to medicine. I don't know why I'm making that connection right now, but a lot of it seems to be there's sort of this linear way of thinking, and then there's this more circular or cyclical way of thinking. And and this is is almost similar where you're saying, sounds like what you're saying at the start is in the industrial model, if the literal biological functions of breathing, sleeping, eating, and being, you know, not too hot or too cold are, are solved, then the, the animal is doing fine. Uh, and then the expanded model is basically saying, no, well, you know, the animal must express its genetic purpose, basically, for it to be considered well, well taken care of, right? You know, sick to bite is what I call it. Yeah, yes, exactly. yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, so when you're managing cattle in, in the industrial model versus the regenerative model, do you notice a change in? You know, I don't know how to put it. I guess their mood or their behavior, or their level of contentedness, if that's a thing that you could you could actually define. Yes, absolutely. I, yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm, I've been ridiculed a little bit for this, and it's okay. No, but, you know, I, I, I tell people that look at those animals. They're happy. Yeah. And, and people, people who don't want to think this way like to ridicule, yeah, happy cow, happy hog. Well, they are. They're, and they express that. If you watch them long enough, you can see that those animals are, I mean, you, you, if, you, if you've got a dog, you, can you tell where your dog's happy? I mean, it, 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 it. there are, they, they, they signal, signal to you, so. You know, I'm, I'm pretty unapologetic about focusing on good animal welfare. What are the things that you see? I mean, obviously, like a dog, you know, running over to you, <laughs> excited, wagging their tail, that sort of thing. Like in in cattle, what is the equivalent behavior? I guess you'll see to indicate that they're, you know, expressing that that instinctual behavior. They're happy. So in a in a perfect world, if I were able to emulate nature with cattle exactly the way I would like to. You know, they would roll every day, properly, fairly, linear, north and south, follow the seasons, you know, maybe from Canada to Mexico. I mean, that's the way oh, following wow. the growing season. That's, that's kind of the way I think that worked. But, you know, I've got my farm here. Uh, t- total farms about 5,000 acres. The part of the cattle grazing right now is about 3,200 acres. And it's divided up into about a hundred and something thirty ish acre pots. Mm-hmm. And we give each herd a different pot every day. We open the gate. And when they and then my biggest herd is about fourteen hundred head. And when I open a sixteen foot gate, that fourteen hundred we have a cow will go through it in about six minutes. And I mean, and, and you don't have to wonder if they're happy or not. I mean, they're fouling around there like a like a kid. Yeah. You know? So you, you don't have to wonder about that. If you if you're at all familiar with the animal, it's been a little bit of time with them. You you recognize it. Yeah. Yeah. Just like you do, just like you do with your dog. Yeah. I mean, it makes sense too, especially if if you've been you know your family's been doing this for four four plus generations that there's some level of familiarity of there's so much subtle knowledge that you're gaining over that time about how these animals behave, and you can detect a difference pretty quickly, I'd imagine. Do yeah, you... but you, in, you would too. I mean, yeah, it, yeah. It, it would take, it, 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 it's just very obvious. It's pretty obvious. Okay, yeah. Yeah, well, so I don't even know if this question makes sense, Will, but do you notice a difference in the quality of the meat from maybe not just the regenerative switch, but also the fact that the animals have been able to express their, their sort of instinctual behavior. Do you think that has some, some impact on the end product? 
No, I, I don't know that. I think yeah. it impacts. I, I think so because I think it impacts the health of the animal. Yeah, yeah. You know, we we give very, we got a lot of animals, and we give very very little medication of any sort to them because they're healthy. You know, I think they're healthy because they're happy and because they live well. Do, do you guys do anything besides cattle, like any other animals? Cows, hogs, sheep, goats, rabbits, and poultry. Oh, wow. Okay, cool. How, how do those all play into the regenerative system? I know a little bit about how, like, you might follow species one after another type of thing. Like, is that, do you guys do stuff like that? Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of that. And uh, it's not, you know, I, I, I used to work the crap out of my herds a little ago. I tried to follow the cattle with the sheep, followed by the goats, followed by the hogs, followed by the poultry. And it's just entirely too much movement. So we move, everything moves, and it moves at its own pace. Okay. And uh, it's just very different. It, you know, it kind of brings me, because where I learned a lot of this, at least initially, was um, Joel Salatin, when he was talking about some of this stuff he was do, doing a lot of it with poultry and you know that's the my first sort of interface with this for you when you started the regenerative transition in the 80s where were you actually learning all this from yeah it was all at that time you know, i didn't know who joel Solomon was i didn't know who gay Brown was i yeah. didn't know who alan savory was and i that for me it was just a, 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 a journey of figuring it out myself and I did a lot of that. Then I started realizing that, hey, there's a guy named Alan Savory in Africa. And he's been doing this a long time. He knows a lot of stuff. Yeah. And ultimately, ultimately I went and spent a couple of weeks in Zimbabwe and you know, Alan Slavery was rich to, to learn from him. Soak it up. Yeah. It's a lot It's a lot quicker than trying to figure it out for yourself. But a lot of yeah. it was figure, figuring it out for myself. Yeah, it's interesting to, um, I guess, dive in from my perspective, I'm sort of jumping in as this this guy who really knew nothing in my early 20s about gardening, let alone the wider systems of regenerative farming, regenerative agriculture, silva pasture, like all these different things. And it's cool to to tie all the dots together of who were the sort of figures that were propelling the movement forward. And, and hearing you do it in the 80s to me is, you know, I started hearing about this in the aughts or the 2010s, I guess. Uh, and so it's it's cool to hear the stories from, I guess, the beginning of the the beginning of the beginning. I guess I mean because if you think about it, the, the way my mental model is about how farming has worked is it does feel like after the 1900s, certainly after the um, World War II era, we sort of forgot how we always did it for a very long time, like maybe thousands of years, and then we're starting to like re remember and then refine those methods into the types of approaches that, that someone like yourself is doing. Yeah, I think we started forgetting it in the end of World War II. I think yeah. that uh, World War II was a real turning point. I know it was. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and that's when we industrialized, commoditized, centralized. Do you think it was just the, it was the, the war effort of, of all the production that was needed during that time, but also the chemical production during that time sort of scaled well into fertilizer production after the war? Well, yeah, the war effort, uh, you know, guys who'd been plowing mules with the, the European VA that operated tanks, well, they got old, they were tractor, they were yeah. plowing. Yeah, yeah. You know, and then... Uh, they were over the the mules. Yeah, and then, you know, the... Uh, uh, some, some of the early uh, nerve gases were part of, became part of the pesticide program. Right, and, right. Uh, uh, explosives became part of the nitrification, uh, ammonia nitrate and such. So, you know, it it was just that lead into the, the uh, linear, industrialized model that yielded the cool. Yeah. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's fascinating. I need, I need to kind of read up on more of that time in history because it actually has a lot of applications to the garden. And so I'm curious, Will, you know, as you transitioned over to this regenerative cattle ranch and also other animals, honestly, quite, quite a big scale, when you talk about vertically integrating that farm, what, is that, what does that actually look like? Yeah, well, when I uh, 
made the decision to move the farm into a higher level of, of animal welfare and regenerative land management. Uh, I, I, could, I could do that in the past, Joe. But then I added to, I increased my cost of production. At the time, I was a monocultural cattle. We've added other species since. And if, if I had to sell them into the commodity market, I couldn't make it work. My cost of production was greater than the, the cost I could get out of the animals. So the answer for me was either to go back to the industrial commodity model, which I didn't want to do, or to find a way to market the beef for, for greater value to reflect the greater production costs. And that's what I did elect to do. And so uh, to do that, I had to, to build a USDA inspected slaughter plant. There was not one available to me at that time. And it's still pretty tough. People, people still struggle to find slaughter capacity. Yeah. But what we did, we did that and eventually found wholesale markets to sell into. How does it, so we, when you say we USDA approved or inspected slaughter plant, are there ones that aren't USDA approved or inspected? I don't actually know how that process works. Uh, there, there are uh, slaughter plants that, uh, well, you can take your animal and, uh, have it slaughtered and take it back home and not sell the, the meat. Ah, uh, okay. And uh, there are a number of those throughout the country. When I was a kid, those were in every county. Right. But they right. all, they, they, they pretty much all went away. Most of them went away. Yeah. And uh, where is that, still is that somewhere you could take, let's say you were a hunter, you could go take a deer that you had hunted and bring it to that type of place, or would they only work with like livestock animals? Well, often they do uh, serve as deer processing plants okay. uh, during the season, and then yeah. cattle slaughter plants when it's not seen. Got it. So for you, one of the biggest vertical steps was building your own slaughter plant, which you know I guess I I sort of always assumed if you were a cattle rancher that you would you would do that process yourself always. And in my sort of brain as a kid, I would imagine you know, the packaged beef going out the door from the ranch. But I guess that's not how, how it was, especially probably in the industrial model, right? You would ship the, the cattle to somewhere else for that process to happen by a different business. Yeah, it's not unusual for a, a cow to be owned by several people during its lifetime. It may only uh, live a couple of years, but it would be born old farm, uh, cow-calf operation. Cat, weed calf sold to a stocker operation. Uh, uh, the stocker sold to a feeder operation. And the feeder sold to a packing operation. Slot. Yeah, so that, that's that's very very kind. In fact, I would say that uh, a huge percentage, maybe ninety percent of the beef in the country, come from a system more like that. Yeah, like three or four different handoffs during yeah. the process of the yeah. life, and, and even more so. Yeah. So, so a lot, I guess, you know, it, I, I guess it makes complete sense. It would be that way, given the sort of linear industrial model, because everyone's going to specialize in the process of, of that cattle's life, I guess that they're, they're the most proficient at, right? If you're good at breeding and raising the calves, then you'll do that. And you'll, you'll say, Hey, you can just buy the, the calves from me when you want to stock or, or feed them, I guess. Right. Well, that's exactly right. I mean, there are feeding operations in this country that, that feed over 100,000 head at the time. Inventory would be 100,000. Yeah. Maybe it, it, it kiss too much a year. And there are slaughter operations that will swallow several thousand head per shift. So it, it's it's really scaled up being, and it, and it takes a lot of cost that I'm doing that. Yeah, right. Because everyone's hyper specialized. So no. take take your model then. Are you well actually, you know, let me go backwards really quickly. Let's say I'm a a calving operation. Uh I, I, I guess I would have the breeding pair. I would pr presumably I'd own the breeding pair, right? And I would then birth the cattle and ra raise the calf to the point where someone else would buy it, right? The shrug to its wean. Okay, yeah. and then and then if I'm the stalker, I I I'm, what I'm buying there is the actual calf itself, right? 
That's correct. Yep. And, and then when that moves to, let's say, the feeder, is it the same situation? The, the feeder is actually purchasing the calf or are they like being contracted by someone else to, to feed the calf? Probably well, both ways, but typically they would buy a calf. Okay. And okay. So e would... each part of the process, you are selling the cattle itself. Uh, it doesn't have to be that way, but yeah. generally it would be mostly that way. Okay. Correct. Got it. And then how does they're that? All, all kind of, they're all kind of yeah. uh, relationships, but generally it's the way you just described it. Like different, different models. that The but... packer would buy it from that feeding operation as a finished calf. Got it. And then the packer's sort of math they say here's here's the here's the cattle here's how much that cattle weighs here's what we could expect we, here's what we paid for the cattle and here's when when we turn it into meat this is what it ends up uh making and that that's my margin right and it's a pyramid you know the uh the guys owning uh, mama cows and land for pasture there's many many of them across the country not nearly as many as it used to be but still many yeah. of them the, uh, and there's less and less at every step that you just went over. And right. When you get when you get to the top step, I, I may have these numbers a little bit wrong, but eighty something percent of the cat, fat cow, fed cow in this country, was slaughtered by three or four packers. So it's a very concentrated, yeah. uh, like market. a like a Cargill or someone like that. Mm, the more like a car manufacturer, like yeah. Chevrolet. Yeah. 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 Yeah, interesting. Okay, so how does that contrast then, Will, with the way that that you guys do it? Do you are you are you all the way through the system end to yes. end, or are you participating? Yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so we're vertically integrated. We have a, we have land, we have animals. They breed, they calve, what's or farrow for hogs or lamb for sheep, etc. Wow. We have a USDA inspected slaughterhouse here yeah. on the farm. What we slaughter, and then we sell them. We used to sell uh, all uh, all the products, meat products, wholesale to Publix or Whole Foods Market or others. Yeah. Uh, Whole Foods dropped us. Now we sell it uh, uh, to, to some, some Publix and uh, yeah. Uh, some others, um, but uh, direct to consumer as direct well. Direct to consumer on the lab, Yeah, yeah. Do you think that's? I mean, that model makes a lot of sense. I can imagine we, we ship direct to consumer, right? The people listen to this podcast. Some of them are customers of ours. They they bought some of our raised beds or our seed trays or our seeds, and it's it's a great it's a great model because y you don't have to p pay the wholesaler their their margin, but then of course now you got to pay to ship it, right? And so, have you seen that be a significant cost driver for you guys when you're shipping out you know something obviously that's very perishable it is we should we uh we ship uh because we have an old we have a little farm store the room for a restaurant yeah we yeah. still have product goons out fedex ups and it's expensive to ship yeah, yeah. And, and i'll say this we we currently ship to 48 states but we don't want to we really want to yeah. be much more regional so i yeah. would love to just sell you know, I'll never be able to sell twenty five million dollars worth of product in Bluffton, Georgia with a little three poor people, but yes. <laughs> to be able to to have to sell in Georgia, Georgia, Florida, Georgia, Alabama would yeah. be uh, a reasonable goal for us. Yeah. Yeah, it kinda it kinda gets back to what we were talking about earlier in this week about how the model is not as scalable as the industrial model and the distribution system since you're vertically integrated it's it's totally different and so the the ideal sort of market size you'd want to serve would would shrink a little bit so that your economics are better to get the product to the customer kind of like my friends who run a market farm right like they they really don't want to be sending that lettuce to washington dc from california because it makes makes zero sense economically, but if they can get a chef to buy it at that that sort of marked up premium because of the way they grow it, uh, in I don't know a twenty mile radius, then they're very happy. Yeah, we would be very happy with that. We, yeah. you know, I really hope and continue to hope that we could become an increasingly regional supplier. Yeah, and this is a we're very different from a big multinational meat company. We're not trying to scale up. You know, we're probably as big as we need to be. So, you know, I have a question about that because I've thought about this a lot is the sort of demand of a, on, upon a business is to always grow, 
right? I mean, you think about it and that's sort of the what's always encouraged in, in business and certainly the economic sort of system we live in is the business has to grow. What Do you have a different sort of look at that when you think about, hey, look, I'm at 5,000 acres. I'm actually a little bigger than I'd prefer to be. I would be completely comfortable servicing my, I don't know, one, two state area as, as best as possible and doing that for as long as possible versus trying to just get huge like like you see a lot of companies try to do. Yeah, absolutely. This 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 model is, uh, this is not super scalable. Yeah. It's, it's a very... Uh, uh, I think it's efficient in its, in its own way, but it's not meant to just grow bigger and bigger and bigger. Yeah, it feels like the only way um, out, so to speak, of the old system would be to create a world in which there are, you know, a hundred white oak pastures in different locales around the the country that are doing things with the same sort of high level framework that, that you've laid out, but obviously in their area, maybe the grazing time is six months and maybe it's a different blend of grasses or the species that they're producing is slightly different. Cause it's all, it's all mapped to the ecology of that land. And then the, those folks are the ones servicing that area with the higher quality output. It's just a harder, it's hard to do. Cause you gotta, you gotta make a hundred more people want to live that lifestyle. Right. I think it's exactly the way it should be. And I, I mentioned earlier, this business is highly replicatable, but not highly scalable. Yeah, yeah. And I think that we would have, if we did have a white oak pastures in every county or near that as possible, you'd have a far more resilient food system. Yeah. You know, I, yeah. I can help a failure here for whatever reason, but... You know, there may be a dozen other white oak pastures in service distance to feed to feed my customers. And I think that's very healthy. Yeah. Yeah. I mean it makes it makes total sense. Um well well, it's been a fascinating week. Uh, I've I've learned a ton. I know everyone listening has as well. I know you have a book coming out. Do, do you mind giving us a little info on that? Well we do. Uh October fifteenth, the 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 only book I'll ever write will be chilling out. It's uh called The Bold Return to Giving a Down from about October the 10th. The Viking Penguin Random House is, is uh, publishing it. Yep. And this is a story of our far 150 something years, five or six generations. Then I, uh, you know, I, I hope that it will help uh, the reader understand the transformation from the industrial model to this farm or so with yeah. food production. Yeah. Well, I will, I will certainly be grabbing a copy myself and it's in the podcast description for everyone listening to take a look at. Thank you so much for, for coming on, Will. It's, it's been super enlightening week for me. And if I'm ever out in Georgia, I actually was out there last year. So if I'm out there again, I'll, I'll have to stop by and, and check out the operation. Well, thank you for having me on your show. I really do hope you'll come see us. Thank you.